All right, welcome to topic 10, which is essentially the final uh, topic in statistics, um, in our exploration of inferential statistics, which has come after our descriptive statistics component. And ANOVA really is a method we use for doing multiple t-tests at once. And this is required because um, often we have multiple data sets. We have more than just two data sets. So we're not just comparing one mean to another. We might have five data sets that we want to compare all of them at the same time rather than doing every possible combination of t-tests to find which ones are significantly different. What the ANOVA does is tell us if there is a significant difference in any of the data sets. And if there is, then we can do some quick further exploration to see which of the data sets within our entire set are different from each other. We can follow the same hypothesis testing techniques. We develop a test statistic, this time called F. With a PC, Excel does this very quickly. With a Mac, when you don't have the data, analysis tool pack it takes a little bit longer but we'll all be learning how to do it the longer way because that means you understand the mechanics behind it so during this subject during this topic we'll be looking primarily at the wolf river contamination data set but there's another data set as well uh, the nematodes data set right at the end um, which you can also use. The Wolf River contamination um, data set has the contamination levels of two chemicals, aldrin and hydrochlorobenzene, HCB, in a river at three different depths within the river. The surface, the middle or mid-depth, and the bottom. And for both of these contaminants, we get their relative concentration, no, their concentration at those three depths at multiple sites. So take a moment to download that. Um, we'll, having, we'll be looking at some screenshots of that data set a little bit later on. I've done the full analysis of the Aldrin data set for you, but you'll need to do the HCB data set yourself, but you can just follow my lead in the Aldrin one. I've got both the quick data analysis tool pack way and the full working. So ANOVA, it's not something to be feared, um, but it is one of the most powerful statistical tools that you can have. Um, probably second only to the t-test, because really an ANOVA is multiple t-tests, but uh, it's probably the most used. Uh, the word ANOVA, or the, it's really an acronym, or an abbreviation, is an abbreviation for analysis of variance. It allows us to interrogate multiple data sets, and what it does is looks at where the variation in the data sets are. Is there a lot of variation within each sample? Or is there more variation between samples and very little within each sample? The way ANOVA works is actually comparing the amount of variation within a sample, within each sample, compared to the overall variation in the entire set of samples. And if there's more variation between the samples, as there is within it, then we say that there's a significant difference. You'll see a lot of formulas in this, and really the formulas, if you look at them closely, they're just an extension of that sum of deviations we looked at in topic one. Um, and a lot of them are the basis of the calculation of variance, or which leads to the standard deviations. So it's that sum of deviations, which is the sum of the difference between each data point and the mean. So what I have here is uh, a little graph which shows the breakdown of this data set. And this is for the Aldrin concentration in the streams. The overall question which will be guiding this subject, this topic, is is there significantly different contamination levels at different depths in the Wolf River? For example, are there, is there more Aldrin at the surface compared to the bottom? Why would we be asking this question? Well, it might bias our sampling. If we're only taking our samples from the bottom of the river and there's actually significantly less con contamination at the bottom, 
then the top, we're not getting a true picture of the Aldrin concentration. How I've done this graph is I've just put the mean, signified by a different shape and colour, the mean Aldrin level at the surface, the mid-depth and the bottom of the stream. And the error bars are the 95% confidence interval around that sample mean. So it's 95% confidence interval for the true mean concentration at each of those depths. Calculate that by getting the T value for the degrees of freedom in each sample and multiplying that by the standard error, which is the standard deviation of the concentrations at each level divided by the square root of the sample size. One of the ways we ask are two things significantly different is we think about them as distributions. And then let's have a look, first of all, let's look at this on just face value here. Um, in with the red triangle, we've got the 95% confidence interval for the sample mean, for the true mean, Aldrin concentration at the bottom of the river. We'd say something is significantly different if the sample mean of it is out, outside the boundaries of the 95% confidence interval for the true mean of the other sample. So look here, the surface mean, the blue diamond, is outside the 95% confidence interval for the true mean concentration at the bottom of the river. Therefore, we'd say that they're significantly different. It's very easy to see this just again on face value with only three samples, but imagine we had 20, 25 samples. It would take a much longer time. This is where ANOVA comes into it. And not only does it allow us to tell if they're significantly different, we can see how different they are and where the variation is coming in. The first things we calculate in an ANOVA is the total variation in our data set. In our data sets. The overall variation, if we pulled all our data sets together, what's the overall variation? And we calculate that simply. We subtract from each data point, from all our data sets, from all our samples, the overall mean. And on this graph here, I've actually put, given us the overall mean with this yellow circle. You'd think there'd be more variation. The 95% confidence interval for the overall mean is quite small. When you look at how far the samples vary. And the reason it's so small is because the sample size of the overall mean is three times larger than the sample size for each one of those individual samples. And because the standard error, which helps govern the margin of error in a confidence interval, is made up, is divided by the square root of the sample size. As the sample size increases, the margin of error decreases. As another indication uh, on face value that there's some significant difference at play, there's the range 95% confidence interval for the true mean overall concentration in the stream. And you can see that the sample means for both the bottom of the river and the top of the river are outside that 95% confidence interval. In ANOVA, we call each sample that we're comparing a group. So in that Wolf River contamination, within each contaminant, we have three groups, the surface, the mid-depth, and the bottom. And all ANOVA, all ANOVA does is compare the amount of variation within the groups, totaled together, with the variation between the groups. And those combined is the total variation in the entire set of samples. The within group variation is the sum of the variation within the group. So we find out how much variation there is in group one, group two and group three, add them together. This is also known as the error. And the sum of all the errors together is called the sum of squares error. We'll see that. The between group variation, how much variation is there between each group, not within the groups, between them, is known and that between group variation when it's summed together is the sum of the variation between the groups. 
The total variation is the within group variation plus the between group variation. So the total variation is referred to as the sum of squares total or SST. And it's called the sum of squares because we get each data point, subtract from that the overall mean of the entire set of samples, then square it and sum them together. So we get each data point, subtract the overall mean from it, square that value, and then take the sum of them. You'll recognize this summing, we did that in the variances, to make them all positive. This graphically is shown down here. We have three groups, much like the Wolf River one, three data points in group one, four in group two, and four in group three. The overall mean, which took the average of all those data points, is signified by that black line. So the sum of squares total is subtracting the value of each data point with the overall mean and squaring that, summing it together. Sum of squares total, the total variation. The sum of squares within groups, the within group variation, sorry, known as the sum of squares within group, or SSE for sum of squares error, is the sum of each data point in a group minus the mean of that group. So in group one, it would be each data point minus the mean of group one squared summed together. We'll see how easy that is to calculate with the spreadsheet. So you do that and you do that for group two. So each data point in group two minus group two's mean squared added together and the same for group three. And then you add all those together. So the total within group variation or sum of squares error. And here's that within group variation in the spreadsheet for the Wolf River contamination data sheet. In columns A to C, we have the raw data. Then in columns D through E, I've done the calculations for the sum of square error, where we get each data point and subtract from that the mean of that group. In column M, N and O, I've calculated the mean standard deviation and sample size for each of the data sets, each of the samples, surface, mid-depth and bottom. So for example, the average concentration of aldrin at the surface is 4.2, with a standard deviation of 0.7. The margin of error, which we'd use to calculate the 95% confidence interval, isn't required for ANOVA, but is required to calculate those graphs, and that's simply the T value at that sample size multiplied by standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size, the sample error. T times the sample error. Um, so what I've just done, you can see that in the formula bar, for this first cell I've just taken the first value from the surface, subtracted from that the mean of the surface, so 3.08 minus 4.2 squared. And then the next cell down, 3.58 minus 4.2 squared. Done that for the entire column. Did that for the mid-depth column. The first one would be 5.17 minus 5. Got all of those. And then in cell M13, M14, sorry, I've added all those numbers in those three columns together. If we're moving along for the total variation, what I've simply, we could, we could get the SST by calculating the SSG and the SSE and adding them together. Or but I've calculated SST separately, which is the total variation, which is each data point minus the overall mean squared and added together. So the first one there is 3.08 minus 5.1 squared. The next one down, 3.58 minus 5.1. That's the overall mean found in P8 squared. And then for the SST, I've just... Um, summed all the cells from G4 down to I13. Now with SSE and SST we can calculate SSG by subtracting SSE from SST because SSE plus MSG, SSG equals SST so you subtract SSE from SST you get SSG uh, but we can also calculate that separately and I do apologize for these TLA's three little acronyms, but they're unavoidable. So the between group variation is calculated a little bit more simply. We just subtract the mean of each group 
would, sorry, we subtract the overall mean from the mean of each group, squared. Then we multiply each of these calculations by the sample size of that group. So for example, we get the mean of group one, we subtract the overall mean from it, we square it, then multiply it by the number of individuals in that sample. So in the case of group one here, it would be three, because there's three data points in that set. We do that, and this is the part that's missing from the bottom of the slide there for some reason, we do it to normalize this calculation for the difference in sample size. And so we get the relative contribution of each group to the between group variation. So group two would be the mean of group two minus the overall mean squared times four, because there's four data points. We do the same for group three, then we sum those together. So it's just three calculations summed together. So I've calculated that for us in a single cell there in M13. You can see the formula up there, and simply all I've done is, calc is subtract the overall mean from each mean individually, squaring those and multiplying them by the, the sample size in each of those groups. So the first one would be 4.2 minus 5.1 squared times 10. The next one, 5 minus 5.1 squared times 10. Then 6 minus 5.1 squared times 10. Add it all together. And that gives us 16.83. And you should be able to see that SSG plus SST, as promised, equals SST. So actually, you only need two of those to work out the third. So there, there's our overall equation, SST equals SSG plus SSE. Now, to finish our ANOVA off, we have to do a slight alteration to these numbers and find the mean of them. We need to find the mean of SSG and SSE. And when we do that, we get two more three-letter acronyms. So we get the mean of the sample so, uh, sum of squares between groups, or SSG, by getting SSG and dividing by the number of groups minus one. So in the Wolf River contamination example, that would be three minus one, two. I is the ANOVA notation for the number of groups, I. Then the sum of squares within groups, or sum of squares error, SSE, we get the mean sum of squares error by getting the SSE dividing by the number of total number of data points in all our samples minus the number of groups. So in the Wolf River contamination example, that would be 30, because there's three groups of 10, minus three, which is the number of groups, or 27. So we can use MSG and MSE to get a test statistic known as F. Do we divide MSG by MSE? So the mean sum of squares between groups divided by the mean sum of squares within groups, also known as the mean sum of squares error. That gives us a number F. If F is above a minimum number at a certain level of confidence, we say that there's a significant difference within our groups. We find this minimum value of F, known as F critical, using an F table or using Excel. We won't use an F table beyond this slide here, but we find F by getting the the sample size in the denominator of that ratio, which is the bottom number, the degrees of so the degrees of freedom, which is i minus one, the degrees of freedom, so n minus i, and then the degrees of freedom of the numerator, which is the top number, which is i minus one, so that would be three, and then twenty-seven on down the left hand side. So we find the degrees of freedom in the top, the degrees of freedom on the left, find the level of confidence we're looking for, and then that gives us the F critical. So the minimum value of F for there to be a significant difference within our sample size. But again, Excel, for any given degrees of freedom, would give us F critical that we need our F to be greater than. So in a slide a little bit later on, we see the Excel formula for calculating F-critical, and I've given it to us in the Aldrin example, and you can see that 
the F we calculate is larger than the F critical. Therefore, there's a significant difference within our data sets. Now, it just means that at least two of them are significantly different from each other. It doesn't mean they're all significantly different from each other. Just at least two of them are. So the question is, how can we quickly work out which two they are? And we'll use that, we, we do that by using a number called LSD, believe it or not, or least significant difference. We get that with this simple formula. Dependent on the confidence level we want, generally 95%. So we get the T value for the degrees of freedom of our MSE, which is mean sum of squares error, or mean sum of squares within groups, which is the sample size minus the number of groups. So in the Wolf River example, that is 27, 30 minus three. So we get the T value for 95% confidence with 27 degrees of freedom. We multiply the square root of our MSE we've calculated times one on the sample size, um, the larger sample size plus one on the smaller sample size. So one divided by the largest sample size of all our groups plus one on the sample size of our smallest group. In the Wolf River example, all the sample sizes are 10, so it'd be one on 10 plus one on 10. So T times the square root of MSE times one on 10 plus one on 10. That is the least significant difference. If any of the differences in our means are greater than the LSD, we say they're significantly different. We've got a few assumptions for ANOVA that need to be met, or well, a few conditions that need to be met before ANOVA can be used. Our samples have to be um, accumulated randomly, so random sampling. Um, the data has to be normal. And a very important one is homogeneity of variance. And that just means there's not too much variation between the different data sets. So like one data set has a standard deviation of 10 and all the others have a standard deviation of one. And to make sure that's the case, we divide the larger standard deviation by the smaller standard deviation. And that number shouldn't be too much greater than two. If it's three, we can't use ANOVA. If it's around two, a little bit more than two, that's fine. If it's below two, fantastic. But if it's around three or above, too, too great. So if the largest standard deviation, for example, is three, and the smallest standard deviation of any of samples is one, three divided by one equals three, we couldn't use ANOVA for those data sets. Let's look at an example here um, where a botanist is trying to find out if the number of nematodes in a pot reduces the growth of tomato seedling. So got, they got 16 identical pots, planted tomato plants in them, but added different numbers of nematodes into the pots. And he split the pots into four groups. One set didn't get any nematodes, one got a thousand nematodes added to it, one 5,000, sorry, four of them 5,000 and four of them 10,000. So he randomly, he or she randomly assigned treatments to these pots and made sure it was balanced. So there was four of each treatment. This um, data set, is available to an Excel form. What we've got is the growth after two weeks of the tomato plants in each of the groups. Also giving us the mean and the standard deviation. That's presented graphically. And you can see that the pots that uh, received zero or a thousand nematodes had a much greater growth rate than those that received 5,000 or 10,000, but is there a significant difference between them? So we did this in a hypothesis testing manner. Our null hypothesis would be all the means are the same. Okay, well, the true mean effect of nematodes between 0 and 10,000 is the same. They'll all have the same true mean growth. The alternative hypothesis, which looks like it should be correct in this case, but we're going to test it, not all the means are the same. We're not saying all four of them are different, significantly different, but they're not all the same. So null hypothesis, they are all the same. Alternative hypothesis, they're not all the same. We test the conditions of ANOVA. Namely, is there um, equitable variance between the groups? So we get the largest standard deviation, which in this case is 2.053, and the smallest standard deviation, 1.244, and divide one from the other. Get a ratio. 
If it's a lot greater than two, we can't use ANOVA. In this case, it's 1.65, so ANOVA's fine. The next thing we do is calculate our SST, SSG, and SSE, and from that get our MSG and MSE, divide one from the other and get F. So we calculate our test statistic. Here's the output if we use the ANOVA function in Excel, which we'll see how to do in a minute. Um, well, I should say it's very simple. In fact, you can try that out now by going to the data analysis tool pack if you have it, selecting ANOVA, select the whole data set and press OK. And this is what you get. It gives you the between group variation and the within group variation, the error. It gives us the sum of squares, as so the sum of squares between groups, SSG is 99.6, the sum of squares error or sum of squares within group is 33.29. The degrees of freedom are there. Number of groups minus one, there was four groups. Minus one is three. And the degrees of freedom of the error is the overall sample size, uh, minus, which is 16, minus the number of groups, which is four, which gives us 12. Then we have the mean sum of squares between groups, which is the sum of squares between groups divided by the degrees of freedom, uh, which is 99.6 divided by three, and the sum of squares error divided by 12, which gives us the mean sum of squares error, or the mean sum of squares within groups. 33.29 divided by 12, 2.774. And then this, we can simply work out our F statistic, our test statistic, in this case F, which is MSG divided by MSE, and that gives us 11.96, 33.2, divided by 2.77. So if our F statistic is greater than the F critical for a given amount of uh, given confidence, in this case 95%, then we say there's a significant difference within our groups, between our groups, I should say. The F critical is given here for us, it's 33.49. Our F is bigger than 3.49, so we say there's a statistically significant difference. They've given us a p-value. P-value is the probability that the null hypothesis is correct. We already know that it can't be because our f's bigger than f critical. But what is the actual probability? It's 0.000643. At 95% confidence, we say it's statistically uh, significantly different if it's below 0.05. This is well below 0.05, so they're definitely statistically significantly different. Likewise, if we're at 99% confidence level, our p-value would have to be greater than 0.01 for us to accept the null hypothesis. If it's less than 0.01, we'd reject the null hypothesis. Our null hypothesis was all the means are the same. And if our p-value is less than 0.05 for 95% confidence, then we have to reject that null hypothesis, except the alternative hypothesis is that not all means are the same. Which means are different? Well, it's easy to calculate with our least significant difference. We get T from the T table, which is, we find 27 degrees of freedom, the sample size minus, um, sorry, no, degrees of freedom in this case is the sample size 16 minus number of groups four, which is 12. 12 degrees of freedom, go over to the column for 95% confidence, and that gives us the T value, 2.179. We plug that into the LSD formula, and that gives us the minimum difference between two means for, their, for them not to be significantly different, or the threshold before they do become significantly different. In other words, any means which are more than 2.57 different are classes significantly different. So what I've done is made this Punnett square, where I've put all the treatments on one row and all the treatments in a column, and then I've done the uh, one by one the difference in the mean. So I've subtracted the mean of the zero nematode pots from the thousand nematode pots, and it's 0.175. That's less than our LSD, so they're not significantly different. The zero nematode pots minus the 5,000 nematode pots, however, gives us uh, our different by five. That's greater than our LSD, so we say the, the pots with 5,000 nematodes are significantly different from those with zero, likewise for 10,000. 
Likewise, 5,000 is significantly different from 1,000, and 10,000 is significantly different from 1,000. But 5,000 is not significantly different from 10,000. The difference is 0.15. Therefore, to finish off, off our hypothesis test, we'd say that there is a significant difference, or well, nematodes have a significant effect on tomato growth, with nematode levels over 5,000 reducing, significantly reducing plant growth. So how do we get the F critical if we don't have the data analysis tool pack? Well, we use this simple formula here, f.inv.rt bracket. We put in the p value where the probability threshold we're looking at if for a 95% confidence, we need 0.05. Degrees of freedom of the numerator, that's the degrees of freedom for MSG, which is the number of groups minus one, and the degrees of freedom for the denominator, which is the overall sample size minus the number of groups. And that will give you the F critical. Then you simply have to say, if the F value is greater than F critical, you say that there's significant diff that the P is less than whatever probability you're using. So if you put in 0.05 there, you'd say the P value is less than 0.05, therefore reject the null hypothesis and accept the alternative hypothesis. So now, to have a practice, go to the Wolf River contamination spreadsheet and do the same thing for the HCB levels in the next spreadsheet. The whole template's there. See if there's a significant difference in HCB levels across the um, concentrations across the different levels in the river.